Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, this is the second lecture on the second day of the School for Politics and Critique. Um, for this session, we have Professor Joshua Clover um, giving his lecture entitled Parties of Order. Um, uh, Professor Clover teaches critical and political theory in the departments of English and Com uh, comparative literature at the University of California, Davis, and has also uh, published several key books, including Riot, Strike, Riot. Um, so, uh, Professor Clover, if uh, you want to start, uh, you can begin. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Zachary, uh, especially for doing organizational administrative work in addition to intellectual contributions. Uh, and, and especially to sort of widget the schedule to, to make it work for everyone, including those of us who are, who are far away. I want to thank Katarina and everyone at the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities in Skopje, as well as the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung of Southeast Europe. The Stiftung has always been very kind to me, and I've always been very grateful. And I want to thank everyone who's joined us at what is, for me, Sunrise. I hope you will forgive me for sipping coffee while I speak. And I want to begin by saying that I do not live in Southeast Europe or anywhere in the vicinity. I do not live in the shadow of Orban or the Grey Wolves or Strasha Angelowski. I make my comments from home in California, and I do not mean to present myself as an expert in local or regional affairs. I believe I've had enough direct confrontation in my life with far rightists that I have at least some sense of the concrete stakes of this conversation and of this seminar. But I hope you will forgive me my distance. I wish I could be with everyone in person today. The abstract that I uh, provided for this, I see in retrospect, has enough different moments in it for about five talks. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure they all finally cohere. So I hope finally that you'll forgive me for touching briefly on a series of seemingly disparate concerns and will understand this talk not as a thorough investigation of any of these matters, but as the beginning of a proposal that they might wish to be thought together, that they form a provisional unity in a way that remains to be worked out in detail. So let that be enough of a preface. The talk proper, Parties of Order, begins by naming two limits. The first is what Marx calls the limit to capital, which he insists is capital itself. For those of you for whom that might seem like an opaque formulation, the significance is this. Even as capital is compelled to accumulate just to remain stable, its intrinsic compulsions the requisite mechanisms through which this accumulation is achieved in the same movement undermine capital's own basis for producing surplus value and thus delivering accumulation. Elsewhere, Marx calls this the moving contradiction in that it presses to reduce labor time to a minimum while it posits labor time on the other side as sole measure and source of wealth. And this process is always happening. It's imminent to capital. And in the manner of a dialectical process, even when we see growth, we are seeing the destruction of the possibility of growth. In a process I have elsewhere referred to as the production of non-production, a process now reaching its end. The end arrives in fits and starts and is unevenly distributed, but it has broad and profound effects. Chief among those, arguably, is a declining ability to internalize more labor inputs, such that the absolute and relative portion of humans on the planet who live outside the life-granting discipline of the wage or its derivatives is growing in a movement unlikely to reverse. There are other consequences worth naming, such as the decreasing ability for states, which after all draw their budgets from capital's returns, for states to purchase social stability. These are massive particulars. In general, this is something like a total social fact. So that's the first limit, the end of growth. The second limit is climate collapse. I trust that this does not require much elucidation, being in some ways more empirical 
It would be convenient to say that just as the end of growth is internal to the logic of capital, climate cops is an external phenomenon, but that is not the case. In some regard, we know this historically. The ever improving capacity for dating anthropogenic climate change now synchronizes it almost perfectly with the appearance of the steam engine and the accompanying demand for carbon burn. But we can think of the problem also as a systematic one conjoined with the end of growth. Here's just one case, although a crucial one. Capital's decreasing ability to exploit the global labor pool and its relative loss of absolute surplus value leads to loss of profitability for capital as a whole. Preservation of profitability thus demands countervailing measures. Crucial among these is lowering the cost of physical inputs. And so we see massive investments in infrastructure designed to increase the speed and magnitude and efficiency of resource extraction, even as floods cover Pakistan. The same floods will cover Mumbai and Miami, Istanbul and Jakarta, Lagos and London. So that is the second limit, climate collapse. Now, it may be that I'm still in the preface of this talk in that all substantial political discussion in the present takes place within these two limits and in the shadow of their interaction. This interaction often seems to set social fractions against each other. The clearest example of this is the familiar insistence that resource extraction means jobs, as in the case of say, workers employed on the Dakota Access Pipeline or Nord Stream 2, and thus that climate protection interferes with not just capitalist dynamism, but with the needs of labor, a powerful impasse of the present. At other moments, the consequences of the two limits run in the same direction, a point to which we'll shortly return. Regardless, thinking politics in the present inevitably involves coordinating the two limits, understanding their unity, understanding the balance of particular forces that they set loose in any given circumstance. Now, were I to move from here to discussing the United States presidency or the new constitution that's failed to pass in Chile or the deadly wave of violence against transgender people, that discussion would take place within those two limits. But I want to talk instead about Denmark, sort of. I do not think I can speak about Denmark until I first address the authoritarian turn in Southeast Europe. So let me start there. Uh, drawing a bit from an uh, article I published two years ago uh, called Empire of Graveyards. The Eurozone has been for some time a zero sum economy. Zero sum is simply a way of saying end of growth from the perspective of competition among national economies. As a pair of economists put matters, here's a quote. The core countries have suffered from secular stagnation as their economies have matured and the autonomous part of their growth has diminished. Their economic growth has been propelled by exports to the rest of the EU, leading to structural imbalances within the Eurozone with a trade surplus in Germany and the core countries as the countries in the periphery and super periphery are consumers of core country exports. This account of the zero sum status of the Eurozone is particularly helpful in that it not only names that situation, but frames it as a story of core and periphery, reminding us of that curious double circumstance wherein the Eurozone is itself the capitalist core from the perspective of the globe, while at the same time having its own core and periphery. Wealth flows inward without producing new wealth that might flow back outward. The crisis of Greece post 2008, so dramatic that it drove a nominally socialist government to overturn the absolute will of its people in what can only be called a policy civil war is exemplary rather than unique. Of what is Greece exemplary? Several things, but among them, it is worth extracting three features. One, Greece has persistently provided the figure or possibility or threat of departure from the EU and the Eurozone. 
While the UK, lacking the conundrum of shared currency, was more able to navigate the departure, Grexit is in some sense the original name for the specter of the breakup in a scenario that explicitly dramatized the imbalanced flow of wealth across the Eurozone from periphery to core. Two, Greece saw early on during the post-2008 era, the rise to some parliamentary power of a fascist party tied to a violent street movement. Three, the portion of the Euro periphery that is particularly exposed to the global periphery to extraction zones and sacrifice zones, to the immiseration and warring left behind by colonial demolition, to regions particularly vulnerable to high heat and high waters, to the nations that within the international order serve both as the proletarian states and the lumpen states, where the super exploited and the entirely excluded are left to await the deadly temperatures of wet bulb 35 Celsius. This region is of course, Southern Europe for which Greece is a signal outpost, albeit sharing certain border dynamics with, for example, Italy, Spain, Cyprus, and Malta. And it is particularly Southeast Europe that provides a corridor filled with complex interchanges through which refugees make their way toward the core of the core. To state the obvious, these three features I've identified with Greece are one under the heading of nation, like the idea of the West, like the idea of democracy, these features have moved outward from Greece to the wider landscape. Not that the idea of nation is new, rather it is the particular configuration of the nation within the two limits. The bid for economic renationalization now stocked the Eurozone in its entirety called for by parliamentary parties and social mobilizations across the region. Authoritarian nationalisms, more and less violent, light up the map of Europe. Golden Dawn would prove a spectacle for which the hard nationalism of Fidesz was one durable actuality. And this nationalism is realized, made real in the most literal sense at the border, in border regimes, in the treatment of refugees, in the treatment of everyone deemed not adequately of the nation, those persons for whom the refugee is the paradigm and the border, the place of placement. Now, in some sense, placement is everything. That's what makes order. It is constitutive of the party of order that they put things in their place. By things, I mean people. If capital makes things of people, as Marx, Marx suggests in the section on the fetish character of the commodity, then the party of order carries out the work of putting these particular kinds of things in their place with brutal zeal. In an ultra formalist sense, one could almost say that the specific place doesn't matter as long as everyone is put in one. Hierarchy and subordination are their own ends and more pressingly, the preservation and the extension of the capacity to subordinate. There is putting in place and there is the power to put in place. And that is the ordinal goal for the party of order. But I said almost for this abstraction is incomplete. The particulars of placement matter to the extent that they mean to replicate the order distilled from an image of the past whose main character is that it is idealized romanticized, the idealization always projects a nation that is healthy, meaning in command of necessary resources and bursting with youthful energy. That is to say, the nation before the two limits began to appear for it. Some clarifications are now in order. I do not wish to be seen here as in some implicit way justifying or forgiving the authoritarian regimes and tendencies all around us by suggesting that they are a response to the problem of the refugee and have simply chosen the wrong answer. Both party of order and refugee are consequences of this change situation that I have rendered under the shorthand of the two limits. The double catastrophe that conjures both the growing refugee flows and the new parties of order 
a lord and bondsman for the present laced with fatality. But we must also clarify the significance of nation. The present pressure on the category expresses an extraordinary reversal, a series of reversals, a series of reversals of reversals. The increasing unification of global processes under the law of value, even as value production wanes, the planetarily shared awareness of climate, even as it collapses, these put a heretofore unseen pressure on the status of nation. Nonetheless, I did not mean to exaggerate the role of the state, sovereignty, and so on in the historical drama that I'm trying to outline. There is, after all, in this narrative, no nation absent a national economy. In the first instance, the system of subordination and hierarchy, which is one end for the party of order for authoritarian nationalism, is operative in part because it produces differential citizenship and non-citizenship across which value can flow, abjecting some so as to allow downward wage arbitrage for all. And in the last instance, the placement previously mentioned achieves coherence only within the framework of a political economy. One is in a place to a great degree because one is employed or within the wage matrix. It is exactly those who are excluded from the wage matrix, the social surplus, who are thereby placeless or freed from the bonds of place into the mobility of immiseration. In that population, surplus to the needs of capital that dwells there, that swells the ranks of refugees. Uh, it is that population, which is to say, uh, in which climate refugees are also political economic refugees and the two limits are one. Now, it is over the figure of the climate refugee that Andreas Malm and Kim Stanley Robinson meet in multiple essays and books. In some degree, perversely, they share this with the party of order. The refugee is their orienting subject, or at least one of them. I might even suggest that the voyagers in Robinson's Mars trilogy, the early work that made him a renowned author, are on the one side colonizers, making an actual colony on Mars, but on the other side, refugees, fleeing an earth whose increasing inhospitability, uh, political and ecological, would become Robinson's great looping theme. I want to dwell on Robinson's most recent novel for a few minutes, eventually in relation to Malm's recent book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Without contraries, there is no progression, and I will try to set forth my contraries before the end. But before that, I want to insist on the importance of both these books. Both take on one of the tasks for which books are well suited but rarely achieve, which is entering into thinkability concepts or visions or politics that have been rendered socially unthinkable, set outside the frame that is ideology. Malm's book, if you have not read it, is sorely lacking in actual instructions for how to blow up pipelines. It means rather to take on the taboo against political violence, to mull it over, to reopen the possibility of debate, and at the same time, historicize the question. This is where I am most sympathetic. Any of us are free to offer up our ethical normative stances regarding political violence, often presented as strategic claims about effectiveness, a long-standing rhetorical device that we of a civilization have after millennia finally given its proper name, concern trolling. Against this, Malm begins from the entirely correct position that on the one hand, we must register the force with which political violence already constitutes the domination of capital. And on the other, that open counter violence is at this point guaranteed. So we better have a serious discussion about its practicalities beyond good and evil. This point seems simple, but turns out to be hard to say. And this alone is enough reason to be grateful for the book. Robinson's reason an epical ministry for the future is more difficult to distill into a single function. 
It is as sprawling and manifold as Malm's is compact and polemical. It is an extraordinary book. And I hope everyone here will consider reading it. It is not quite what Adorno described as late style. It has something of that character. A work per Edward Said's concise phrasing declines the serenity of ripeness is all in order to reopen the question of meaning, success, and progress. Robinson has intimated that this is his last science fiction novel, and it is in some regard a return to the Mars trilogy, a kind of coming home, wherein the object of titanic terraforming, world making in its most literal sense, becomes the Earth itself. The Mars trilogy's Frank Chalmers returns here as his inverse Frank May, as if to signal the completion of a circuit with its repetition and total change. More wittily, we encounter the late arriving and unobtrusive character of Arthur Nolan, fascinated by transport and by the vastness of nature, at a remove from social doings, a 60 something Jules Verne fan who circles the planet on an airship. He is that science fiction commonplace, the starship captain but brought back to earth, peering down with a near panoptic view. From his perch, he tracks the great movement of animals, the nascent plenitude to be spotted in the historical world making below him, something like a view of the whole, coming down only occasionally to visit with various characters. Not a starship captain then, but the author himself. He's known for short as art. Like art, like late style, the book as, is at its most extraordinary when it tries to think the whole. Think the interlocking totality that must be addressed in order to address climate change in any significant way. The book's scope and length and multipolar composition. It has over a hundred chapters, over a dozen focalizing characters formal arguments about the need for thinking this complex whole. On multiple occasions and at risk of giving in to the cold charisma of enumeration, the book offers provisional and partial summaries. Somewhere around chapter 89, when the tide has turned, uh, it lists at the meso and micro levels, the good projects that were being undertaken were so numerous that they couldn't be assembled into a single list, although they tried, and it tries immediately. Regenerative ag, landscape restorations, wildlife stewardship, Mondragon style co-ops, garden cities, universal basic income and services, job guarantees, refugee release and repatriation, climate justice and equity actions, first people support, all these tended to be regional and localized, but they were happening everywhere. There are other such passages scattered throughout the book, gathering as it goes. They are figured finally, allegorized arguably, near the very end, when three billion people share in a moment of neo-religious solidarity with the planet, each other, and the possibility of collective flourishing. For us, stuck here in the streets of the present between the two limits, this need to think the whole, to think about all the things that would need to change for anything to change, is itself a taboo subject. As we can witness quite easily in the visions even of the eco-modernists, much less your standard issue liberal, for whom the future in which environmental catastrophe has been mitigated looks a lot like the present, but with more solar and some fields of windmills through which some bullet trains wind. Lukács in his chapter Class Consciousness, and later in the standpoint of the proletariat, makes heavy weather of the idea that it is the workers of the world, because of their position as producers, both of use values and surplus value, because of their entrainment within the capitalist totality that is social production, it is the workers who are uniquely positioned to grasp the whole, to grasp totality, and thus to achieve the consciousness necessary to become a class for themselves, a revolutionary class. Robinson, without using the same language, 
registers that as the planetary proletariat outstrips the needs of production and is increasingly surplus to its processes, production can no longer be relied on to provide this view onto the whole. But as the orienting force of what Lukacs calls second nature wanes, structures made by man for man, as he phrased matters, first nature asserts itself. This captures the truly epochal transformation implied by the two limits and their dynamic interaction. For Robinson and others, Deepesh Chakrabarty is one example. The experience of climate collapse to which all are unevenly subject and through which the environment is disclosed as a systematic unity, indiscreet, human-made, provides the new conditions for the thought of the whole and the possibility therein of a new and revolutionary class consciousness, particularly among the class of those we might call climate vulnerable. And it is this that brings us to political violence, which is in truth the theme that unites Malm and Robinson's recent works. Their handling of this theme is not identical across pipeline and ministry, and it could not be given the differences of kind between the two books. They seem to differ at least in one moment, at least on one pivotal point. Malm spends time debunking in coruscating fashion, the book, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict by Ellen Chenoweth and Maria Stephan. Robinson, on the other hand, seems at one moment to adopt explicitly it's that book's claims, the claims by the Kennedy School professor and the former State Department officer from the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations in Kabul. Over the years, writes Robinson, we saw what worked and refined our methods. Violence didn't work. Numbers did. That's the secret, in case you are looking for the secret in resisting an imperial power. Nonviolent resistance of the total population, or as much of it as you can get. That's what works. But of course, being a novel, this cannot be reduced to the author producing a truth claim. The words are given to a nameless narrator reflecting back from the future on the struggle of Hong Kongers to avoid Chinese rule. We should not take it as the book's summary position, even if it arrives at a relatively summary moment. Ministry, no matter how generically distinct from Malm, joins in its materialist approach. Whatever its preferences, the book knows that open political violence or counterviolence is coming, is at least for the moment an ascendant historical fact. Moreover, for much of the hundred chapters preceding the passage I just read, political violence is not offered simply as an inevitability, but as functional, even necessary from the relatively pacific seizure of the Davos summit early on, made into a week-long re-education camp for billionaires, to various uprisings, assassinations, and lots and lots of ecotage, to the brief but freighted kidnapping of the minister for the future, which is the hinge event of the narrative, if it has such a thing. Even the ministry itself, following this, and perhaps in advance of this event, gets in on the mayhem. It is not just that the two books share an attention to rising political violence in the face of capitalist climate annihilation, however. More dramatically, they offer a specific and total account of political violence, of what it is and what it is for. The key word is terrorism. The function, the goal, in truth, the only possible character of political violence that these two books recognize is to persuade the powerful to believe certain things and to act on these newly instilled beliefs or to act as if they were persuaded, which amounts to the same thing. Kneel down, move your lips in prayer and you will believe, says Pascal. What then are the acts? What is the religion that must now be practiced by newly terrorized global elites in, in these books? It is not even acts plural, but a single act. 
policy reform. Here, the two books form a powerful unity in their idea of meta strategy for climate survival and climate repair. It will require many, many innumerable changes of great and interlocking complexity. It will take place more or less within the present framework of governance and political economy. The interstate system will continue on with its various ruling bodies. Surplus value, the lifeblood of capital, as best we can tell, will still come from the same source. These changes will be achieved as an extension of popular will and desperation by the imposition of political violence toward empowering a social democratic leadership to enable sensible, to enact, excuse me, sensible, humane, equitable, and finally sustainable policies. On this, the two books agree entirely. Both books, that is to say, imagine that the only salient political violence is rhetorical violence. Not in the contemporary sense of rhetoric treated as a form of violence, but in the sense of violence treated exclusively as a form of rhetoric. I promised earlier some contrariness and the time has come. But let me first insist that I do so in comradely spirit as an admirer of both books. And that I do so as a way of thinking with the books, as we say, of trying to push things forward. It is nothing more than I would say to either author sitting in the back room of a local bar over some drinks. This account of political violence seems to me needlessly narrowed in relation to the actualities of history, of what is already happening, of what is to come. It is commonly and persistently the case that political violence or counterviolence endeavors not to send a message, though it may do that as well, but to bring about a circumstance. Sometimes people might destroy lots filled with carbon fired SUVs so that there are fewer SUVs. People are gonna shut down toxin spewing factories to protect watersheds from toxins. People are going to blow up pipelines so that the oil doesn't flow. Others may well take messages from these actions as events tend to be complex and multivalent and you cannot stop people from cogitating on meaning, but that will not be the main goal or function, the operative framework. And there's much to say about this distinction or about the inability to recognize one side of it. It is a risk of political theory that all politics becomes theory, becomes a series of signifying acts, magnifying the need for not a critical political theory, but a critique of political theory. At the same time, the distinction before us is hardly a opaque in some cases. No one, save perhaps the most abstracted of political theorists, thinks that wars, for example, are messages sent to receivers. They are designed to command territory, resources, and populations. No one thinks that the Norman conquest or the siege of Rhodes was rhetorical. In short, large scale state sponsored political violence registers clearly as practical, as designed to bring about a circumstance. Counter violence in the face of this, various anti-colonial struggles offer good examples, are similarly legible. Why then this present inability to recognize the same about climate defense? This illegibility may not be, uh, may be not so much an artifact of political theory as a historical phenomenon corresponding to capitalism's well-remarked character of impersonal domination, its own pretense to transfer wealth as a consequence of the decisions of free subjects decisions perhaps informed by the distant intimation of violence, but still marking a process of appropriation free from immediate seizure made by informed subjects. This is the rhetorical violence of capitalism. Now, I'm not sure about this equation, to be honest. It's an intuition deserving of its own inquiry at a later time. There is, as I said, much to say about the question of political violence within liberatory struggles in the present 
And as that is the main orientation of my own scholarship and my interests, it is tempting to continue along that path. Instead, for the purposes at hand and given limits on our time, I'll uh, make a last or really next to last turn to the context of social democracy itself. This is because in the end, I think that the particular account of political violence I've been drawing forth from these two books makes sense only when social democracy, understood as a particular managerial mode for capitalism pressed up against the two limits, is also understood as the horizon of political possibility. Here, I will associate social democracy and for that matter, democratic socialism with what Moish Postone calls traditional Marxism, which to quote Postone, replaces Marx's critique of the mode of production and distribution with a critique of the mode of distribution alone. Robinson makes this explicit in one of the chapters given over to a nameless philosopher or theorist or cantankerous sage who has been in his few appearances, the book's prophet of thinking the whole of totality. Uh, in chapter 99, the sage remarks that, quote, everything relies on capital, please don't be stupid, invoking for many readers the work of Marx and more broadly, the systematicity of capitalist relations, Lukács' totality, before the same character avers who has capital, how it gets distributed, that's always our question. Much rests on that hour. It is perhaps Proudhon's question, LaSalle's question, the question of social democracy. It is not Marx's question. The presentation of distribution as the only political terrain explains more or less all of the features I have extracted. It explains, for example, any sympathy towards Chenoweth and Stefan's strategy thesis, strategic thesis regarding civil resistance, given that even in the best case, their studies give precious little indication that nonviolence is effective in changing the mode of production, in transforming a political economy rather than winning some limited gains, maybe swapping out one regime for another similar iteration. It further explains the faith in policy reform as a route to survival, liberation, and flourishing, since policy is indeed a useful instrument, albeit imperfect, for redistribution. But here we must remember that policy did not bring capitalism nor its maldistribution, much less its inexorable drive toward maldistribution into the world and cannot send it out. At best, faced with capitalism's intrinsic and existential character of concentrating wealth, policy can provide temporary and partial constraints before the water rolls back down the hill and wealth begins to concentrate again. Now the final, final turn. There is something linguistically strange in the idea of preserving climate, ecology, nature, and thereby our own existence through policy solutions. Given the roots of the word policy in polis, the Greek word for city. City where the smokestack industries took hold, city whose rise tracks the rise of anthropogenic, anthropogenic climate change. I do not mean to file a brief against cities, much less take the so-called anti civ position just to note the irony of policy. Its main aspect, as I suggested moments ago, is the logic of constraint. Policy begins at the edge of the city, at the border of the polis that says who and who is not a citizen. For better and worse, policy constrains what you can do and where you can go. It reforms what is already formed. One cannot make someone free by policy. Even with the legal ends to slavery, no one was made free, but that they had previously been made unfree. Policy constrained the power to make and enforce that unfreedom. It is a relatively simple matter for policy to constrain the purchase of, say, heroin, at least legally, and far more difficult for policy to enjoin us all to become purchasers of the same. 
and as our friend from Slovenia would say, and so on and so on. Policy can only constrain. The policies in question for us here today are not the ones imagined by Malm and by Robinson, which are by and large salutary and would be desirable if one believed in a further irony that policymakers were unconstrained in their policymaking. Rather to come full circle, I speak of the policies contemplating those shared subjects of Malm and Robinson, those shared subjects of Hungary and Greece and Germany and the United Kingdom and North Macedonia, the climate refugee, who is the war refugee, who is the economic refugee. The refugee is, as noted previously, a refugee precisely because they have been catastrophically freed from whatever was binding them tightly in place, but not freed from the demands of survival and the desire for flourishing. Now, as they begin their movement across the surface of the planet, they must be put in place. And against them, against their free movement, arise the parties of order. The parties of order put in place. They put in place policies for the polis. They put in place border policies. Constraint comes from the Latin term meaning to bind tightly together. But it is not refugees who are bound tightly so much as the border itself. That pure fiction, which is the pure fact of constraint, the edge of policy. It can bind more and less tightly, but it cannot unbind. Policy is border and border is policy. I began by rehearsing the political economy of contemporary European border policies as a way of thinking together the dialectical rise of authoritarian regimes and climate refugees confronting each other within the unrelenting determinations of the two limits that are the end of growth and climate collapse, driving a provisionally fascist renationalization that poses new or renascent parties of order against the global sway of finance and the planetary tide of refugees. But I cannot end without noticing that it would be incomplete to discuss only the right parties of order. A critical fact of the present is that we have seen this sort of development as well within various precincts to the left. I promise you Denmark and here at the last second we are. It is on nations and governments like this that we are to pin our hopes, I suppose. Their 2020 Climate Act, ambitious and enforceable, has been treated as a model for climate policy globally. According to the political scientist Fleming Yule Christiansen, climate policy was the only thing that the left coalition could unite behind. The Prime Minister, Meta Fredriksson, a social democrat, campaigned on the act and said on that topic, we'll be one of the most ambitious parliaments in the world. Her other campaign theme was immigration, of course. It was on this topic that the opposition, the reactionary Danish People's Party, had been the strongest. Fredriksson managed electoral success, not simply via popular environmental policies, but by steering the Social Democrats to meet the Danish People's Party well more than halfway on immigration, establishing policies regarding refugees and asylum seekers that are even by the standards of contemporary Europe, extraordinarily restrictive, constraining we might say, though we might also say that they are deadly. Denmark, as you all know, is not alone in this. Social Democratic, Green and other nominally progressive parties in Germany, among other places, have shifted toward increasingly restrictive border policies and ascendant hostility toward refugees, often under the progressive banner of shielding domestic laborers from competition. It is very hard to locate this border policy in relation to the conventional political spectrum. Brexit, which muddied everything, made this clear. As the question divided labor and the Tories both, and was irresolvable by any of the conventional procedures that depend on the left-right opposition. We can certainly stamp our feet and insist that the appearance of left renationalization and left border regimes 
arise only because of electoral pressure from right populists and right nationalists. That is a version of the no true Scotsman fallacy, or that is the inner nature of policy, of how it comes into being, how it tends toward constraint, or all are driven by the same material conditions, the same political economic compulsions, the same two limits. Climate collapse and capital stagnation will mean that there will be surplus populations and there will be refugees and there will be a zero sum game in which the Eurozone economy cannot expand its labor pool and intensifying pressure on resources. The redistribution which serves as the alpha and omega for social democrats can move in some directions and not others, as long as there is no growth. And there is no growth. Whatever one believes about the contents of various politicians' hearts, we must concede that Europe is right now developing a boom in left parties of order. This politics, alas, is certain to be a growth market. Against that, only a resolute and furious internationalism will do, non-economic, without constraint, beyond policy, beyond both the reactionaries and the social democrats. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to have a conversation about this further. Right. Thanks so much for that lecture. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll move to the question period now. Um, if you're in Zoom, then you can just raise your hand virtually. If you're um, here present, then you can just stand up and go to the laptop where Reist is. Um, since it's over Zoom, it'll make it much easier. Um, so we'll start, I guess, in the room. And then in the meantime, if anyone's in the Zoom, uh, just raise your hand. For now, there is no question from the room. Hmm. All right, then I guess I'll start with um, my own sort of quick question. It's yeah, when we speak of internationalism, um, say, as opposed to this uh, hegemonic and nationalist um, stance, it seems uh, interesting that uh, so many populist parties um, have sort of appropriated what appears to be um, a sort of universalist stance. I mean, this is also what happened um, the United States and Trump to an extent, well, of course, of uh, lots of other factors. So I was wondering what you thought of um, the sort of ability to parse out this sort of rhetoric of the, the, the universalism of a worker or something like this and sort of actual internationalism and how this works discursively sort of, if that makes any sense. It does absolutely. I mean, it makes too much sense, and that's a that's a um, seemingly simple question that deserves its own conference. Um, uh, the I, I mean, I I would want, although it would take us working together a long time, I think, to separate out internationalism and universalism. Although they're both sort of floating enough terms that one can see how they become entangled and conjoined. Um, but you know, universalism being for me, something like uh, a shared underlying logic or structural force uh, in which, uh, uh, which uh, exercises its effects on everyone um, and, and is that in, that, in that sense, universal uh, and, and, which, and which thereby presents potentially uh, a universally shared interest. Uh, toward toward a certain end. So so of course a classic sort of the ortho Marx version of like you know workers of the world uh, um, uh, as you know every, um, the the vast majority of the planet is joined by being uh, compelled to uh, um, generate surplus value for capital and uh, you know I, I talked about the Lukács account of totality right that that that's the universalism that brings together not everyone because it doesn't bring together the capitalists but there's not that many capitalists in the scheme of things so quasi universal internationalism I think of as something somewhat 
different. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm using it in a, a absolutist sense. I simply mean that um, uh, um, decisions, uh, um, any decisions about how to proceed politically, any, any answer to the question, uh, what is to be done, mm -hmm. must ask itself the question, it, are the, um, do the uh, political gains of the project I'm imagining uh, redound more to my nation at the expense of other nations, possibly behind my back, possibly without noticing. And we have to dwell on that and reject that and reflect on that. So for example, you know, a lot of accounts of the Green New Deal in the United States, I'm sure this is a term that circulates broadly, right? But the Green New Deal in the United States not all of them, it's become more, you know, it's a project that, that under that name is a few years old. Um, and it's become, I think, better articulated of late, but originally uh, it imagined that, uh, that, you know, this green revolution or green transition would in fact be economically beneficial because that's how you sell a project. You say, well, it's gonna, it's, it's not just, it'll be good for the environment, but it, it'll actually produce a jobs boom. And so, and it became clear that uh, the structure that was being imagined would, would, would maybe, ideally, I don't think so actually, produce economic benefits in the United States while generating catastrophic, what we generously call externalities, which is in fact like, you know, sort of pocket backdoor colonialism, uh, you know, extraction of various rare earths in Mongolia and precious metals and so, and so on. And, and value flow from the periphery to the core, which it wouldn't just be like wealth from no money, from, wealth from nowhere. So that's, that was an example of like a, a failure of internationalism, right? And that for me is somewhat different from universalism. That mm -hmm. said, um, the phenomenon you're pointing at is an important one and very relevant to the, to the argument I was trying to set forth in, in the talk, which is, I don't know how it is there, but in the United States, certainly we've seen lots of nominally, lots of maybe an exaggeration. We've seen regular cases of nominally left thinkers um, and, and groups behind them, you know, organizations, parties, whatever, um, claiming that there's some particular version of the left based on identity or some other non-universal particularisms, which in its insistences has betrayed the one true universalism of workers, uh, and thus must be aggressively rejected and thus pits uh, um, the, the, this idea that a true populist uh, um, uh, uh, universalism of workers must oppose itself to any particularisms such as race or ethnicity or caste or so on and so forth, gender, sexuality. And that's absolutely been a discourse that, that gives you a good example of sort of parties of order on the left, where they're nominally left, but they really require the subjugation of uh, the subordination of the interests um, identified by race or the, or the interests of trans people or what even, or, or so on must be subordinated and subjugated. So, and that, that I agree, that phenomenon is much like the, the left parties of order I'm talking about that has to be absolutely resisted. And you know, I would say in the um, in a way that's reductive but not false that that position of of holding on to a, a supposedly worker-centered popula uh, uh, universalism against particularist claims is uh, analytically mistaken even if you uh, you know remain uh, demand or, or preserve some fidelity to Marx Marxism orthodox Marxism or whatever, I think it's manifestly the case that value production, if we center that in our political analysis, requires all those differentiations, requires racial hierarchy, requires gender hierarchy, requires so that value can flow and wages can be arbitraged downward and so on. Marx gets into this in his essay on the Irish question about the difference between Irish and, and British workers, right? Um, and uh, so, that, that um, particularization along those lines is a function of capital. And thus one has to stand with those who are particularized because that that's, a, 
consequence of capitalist domination. And imagining that you're taking the, the, the opposition of capital involves ignoring those struggles rather than addressing them is simply a, an analytic mistake, even within an orthomarxist uh, context of trying to understand value production. So I think it's very important to impose that, but you're right to raise that as uh, um, the uh, as an example of the, of the sort of these development of yeah. like left parties of order that demand this hierarchization and placement. Or I, think so much that... the, I think there's a question in the chat and it's long. Can I have a second to read uh, it? I think... <laughs> Or maybe it's just yeah. I think Katerina was. Oh, it's Katerina. Yeah, Zach can read it so that the the others can re, uh, hear it as well. Very good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. I cannot turn on my camera right now. All right. Yes, yeah, so I'll read the comment quickly. It's uh, I concur that the 2020 European Green Deal and the American New Green Deal, by being policy projects, are insufficient to address the gravity of the global climate crisis. My question is, what would have been a proper political response to it? And what's a more socialist one? P.S. By the way, it seems like the deal in Europe is being renegotiated and reshaped beyond recognition. And thanks to the Ukraine war, we'll be relying on fossil again. Uh, at least this upcoming winter, if not longer. Uh, yeah, at least this coming winter, if not longer. Um, and then, sorry, my Zoom. Uh, Interestingly, most of it will be imported from the U.S. and Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Katerina. Katerina is always guaranteed to ask challenging questions, uh, as, I, as I know from experience. Um, I mean, the first thing I should say is, I don't think I have an answer to this question. I, I think that if I had, like, the clear policy solution to all of this or, or um, beyond policy solution to all of this, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here at this conference. We'd be out doing this, like, you know, enacting the solution and it would be all, all said and we're, we're thinking on this together. So I don't, I don't want to claim to have answers. I'll try and offer a couple remarks so that Katarina doesn't feel um, like I'm, I'm dodging entirely. Um, the first thing I should say is I don't, the, 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 I, I worry this, an, this answer will be overly, not not uh, stern, but overly militant. We'll see how it goes. Um, I the question of like the proper socialist response is a matter of indifference to me, as I'm not a socialist. Um, I'm a communist. There was a time in history where we believed that socialism was an intermediate step to communism. Right, that's Marx's argument in the critique of the Gotha program. Uh, um, I don't think we're in that situation anymore. I've actually, uh, uh, I wrote an essay about this a couple of years ago called The End of the Debate about how we, how that, that vision of a transition out of capitalism into a sort of intermediate phase of socialism or social democracy or so on toward communism, that vision existed for specific reasons and had to do with capitalist growth and dynamism, which no longer exists. And there is no longer, uh, that route is no longer open. And so instead we're offered with a choice between socialism and communism and worse. Uh, and socialism is not the right choice. Uh, so I don't identify, the question for me is not what, what the... Uh, uh, sorry, Joshua, what, and let me clarify. What I am curious about, yes, is indeed the communist response, but so many... Uh, Perhaps also the people in the audience uh, very often use the two terms as synonymous. So I chose the milder one, but yeah. what I had in mind was yeah. the communist response. So please go ahead on yeah, yes. tell us I, I, what I, the communist response be. I, I, I appreciate that. I, just, I thought it was, might be worthwhile to, yeah. um, to try and extract the terms and so they, they, they're not used interchangeably. Maybe that's enough of a project for the rest of my life is to try and convince people not to use them interchangeably, but I, I'm not sure I will succeed at that, at that project. But yeah, I mean, I think the communist response um, has to be that it, that it can't be done via policy, that what has happened of late, in fact, has demonstrated that exactly, where we see policy drifts in one direction, as, as Katrina notes in the question, Right, policy seems to be moving in one direction and then it moves back in the other direction as circumstances change. Uh, 
the circumstances are always going to change. And as I note, the material circumstances are in some sense going to get worse. The two limits I described, the end of growth and climate collapse, are not going to get any better. Um, and they will exist as material pressures on policy, and policy will meet them by uh, 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 um, in ways that have no chance of preserving the possibility for our collective flourishing. Um, so I don't think that we can, can, can um, be communists and be committed to policy response. We have to be committed to the position that policy response is the, is the route to death, um, that it cannot save us, that there has to be some response beyond policy. And this probably brings us back to the question of political violence, right? I, this was one of the themes that I touched on in the talk and uh, it's a significant one. Um, and uh, if there's gonna be a, um, a path to communism, I'm not advocating this, of course, but if there's going to be a path to communism, it's going to involve political violence. It's not going to involve political violence to persuade people to make policy changes. As I meant to suggest in the talk, that's exactly the, the foreclosed route um, because policy changes can't do it. Uh, it's going to involve efforts to bring about various situations. I think that the correct communist response is to think about things like the pipeline blockade at, 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 uh, at Standing Rock, um, uh, the, the massive pipeline blockades in Germany, the pipeline blockades across Europe of, that have happened with Nord Stream 2, the pipeline blockades in indigenous territory in uh, what's called Canada and Wet'suwet'en territory. These are all examples, not of particularistic struggles of, in, of indigenous groups or so on and so forth, but uh, of, of, of what can be a communist response. And that I think is what people should be thinking about, not about policy engagement. I hope that's not too extreme, but I can only say what I think. Uh, hello, Joshua from me. We have two questions from two different uh, participants. Uh, you uh, said that we shouldn't be constrained uh, by the international reg regulations, but uh, I would say also by the law because uh, for example, during the um, uh, speaking of political violence that you had uh, in your presentation, uh, I experienced a lot. For example, I was uh, starving 12 years during the Nikola Gruevsky uh, regime. And uh, uh, let's say mildly oriented uh, European community said it was a hybrid regime, da, 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 but they did uh, to do anything about it. Uh, furthermore, they gave them awards for best politicians. So I would say we shouldn't be uh, perhaps constrained by the international law because uh, they couldn't uh, have uh, some more rigorous um, measures uh, because then it will be interfering in the eternal affair of another country. So. Do you think that uh, we should initiate or lobby more for uh, a changing of uh, this international law? Because I think nations should give hands uh, to each other and help in this kind of situation and not just uh, play some, I don't know, perverse diplomacy. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I just agree with that. Uh, I don't think we should be constrained by, well, let, let me try and be somewhat more uh, slow and measured with my answer than I usually am. Um, I'm not sure who the we is, but <laughs> me and the person who just asked the question, I don't, I don't think we should be constrained by international law. Um, I mean, in some sense, we are constrained. Law comes with the, with the threat of violence uh, behind it, or, or it, has, it, has, you know, it, has the, it has the force of violence or it has nothing. Um, and and we, we have to be aware of that and understand that situation. But I don't think we should be constrained by inter international law, nor should we commit to uh, reforming and improving international law. It's the logic of constraint that moves us toward inevitably us, meaning the planet, toward death. Um, the, the, the logic of constraints and the, and the set of constraints. 
again, I do not mean to be making what seems to be an anarchist argument of like all or a, or a sort of the caricature of an anarchist argument of like all laws are bad, all all um, all limitation is bad, man. I just want to be free. Now, first of all, most anarchists are, are far more interesting and sophisticated and thoughtful and coherent than that. But second of all, uh, I, they don't mean for that to, to be my argument. I mean for my argument to be that I, maybe to reduce it in very simple ways, I deeply accept the proposition that laws are ideological expressions of underlying relations, the underlying relations of capital and the underlying compulsions to produce surplus value, even at, even at, even at limits. And that if we do not change those compulsions, the compulsions to change, to, the compulsion to produce surplus value for capital, if we do not change those compulsions, it does not matter what we do to laws. That will be purely cosmetic and will save no one. Well, it'll save someone, but it will not save us. It will not save the planet. So our work as communists is to change those underlying compulsions, the compulsions of capital, and the laws will follow. That is where we do our work, not at the level of the law. And I'm baffled by people who think they are communists and think that's the place of intervention. I hope that's an answer to your question. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I will uh, comment based on your uh, presentation and hopefully you will uh, comment uh, more. Um, uh, mainstream uh, discourse is uh, saturated with concern of uh, right, right wing uh, populism and authoritarianism. And uh, climate crisis is something just to mention from time to time, acting that it is uh, that they are concerned. Uh, so, uh, and it is quite important to, to connect uh, uh, the issues of uh, authoritarianism, uh, climate uh, refugees, and climate crisis. Because uh, uh, during the migrant crisis in 2015-16, uh, there was a surge of right-wing populism, and uh, the numbers uh, for uh, uh, that are... Uh, prognosed that uh, uh, climate re of climate refugees that will come that will become uh, so much people is much bigger number uh, uh, compared to that uh, migrant crisis so uh, it is uh, uh, expected that authoritarianism and right wing uh, populism will uh, arise as uh, stronger as uh, the waves of uh, climate refugees. So it is very important uh, uh, to connect uh, the concern of, uh, of the, uh, about authoritarianism with the, the concern of uh, climate uh, cr crisis, because uh, 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 now the mainstream uh, discourse is Okay, we are uh, concerned about the uh, right-wing populism and its rights rise, but uh, mainly we want to uh, 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 ignore the issue that we have uh, a potential of a strongly uh, uh, emergence of uh, of right-wing populism and ecofascism in the context of. Uh, uh, the effects of climate crisis. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. I, 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 I just uh, would, you know, applaud. I think that's correct um, and, and, and important. The, the one thing I would add perhaps uh, is, and I tried to touch on this in, in the talk, I think in conversations with people, it's important to think together and remind ourselves that the authoritarian, these authoritarian regimes 
are not simply responses to refugees, right? A response to stimulus, where first there's refugees and thus authoritarianism arises to address them. Because I worry that that becomes a kind of language of justification. It's like, well, we have to do something about these refugees and we can understand why this authoritarian regime arises in the face of this risk or this social problem. And I don't think that's exactly right. So what the, what the, the person who just uh, spoke, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't learn your name. Um, what the person who just spoke uh, pointed out is absolutely correct, entirely correct, that thinking together the authoritarian regime and climate crisis, the climate refugee is vital. And in, in, in some sense, it will always fail not to do that. To, to fail to do that uh, is, will be an incomplete thought, which will lead to uh, incomplete conclusions, mistaken conclusions. So we absolutely want to think them together, but not as stimulus and response, right? But as, um, um, as, 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 as duly produced by these two limits that I talked about, end of growth and end of capitalist growth and uh, climate collapse. Um, and so that to both of them are produced by those, by those two limits. And uh, uh, so to address that situation, we're gonna have to address the end of growth and climate collapse. We are not going to address the end of growth within capitalism. Capitalism cannot solve the problem that, uh, that is the end of growth, since that is capitalism's essence and nature to produce that end of growth. Uh, so to address the end of growth, we cannot address it by, by, reform, by, by proposing sort of Keynesian or reformist solutions within capitalism. And we're going to have to address those limits, the end of growth and climate collapse, to address the complex interaction between authoritarian states and climate refugees. So yes, we have to talk about them together. Absolutely, we have to draw the connection together. But drawing the connection means pointing ourselves toward the underlying conditions that produce both of them. Uh, and that's where the fight is. And it is the fight of our lives. We don't have much time and there's nothing to do but turn ourselves absolutely, unflinchingly, and militantly toward addressing those two limits. There's nothing else to do. So hello, now it's my turn to ask a question. First, of all, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, however, I'll have to voice some disagreements and I genuinely uh, want to know your opinion on that. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether I've heard correctly, but I think you've mentioned Erika Chenovet while you were speaking, and I was like, I, I actually had attended a lecture by her as well. Um, personally, I, I reject the justification behind political violence. However, empirically, what I find really interesting is that Chenovet has actually proven before the pandemic that nonviolent movements tend to be more successful than violent ones. And now with the pandemic and with the wave of civil resistance that the pandemic carried with it, uh, what we actually saw is a, a decrease in the effectiveness of both movements, of both type of movements, whether violent or nonviolent. Yet what we saw is that the nonviolent movements were still more successful in accomplishing their stated goals. So I would like to hear your opinion on that, as well as concerning the climate catastrophe and the climate change and climate crisis. Uh, shouldn't environmentalists treat this issue as a super political issue, trying to attract as much people behind it, as much people to, in a way, to increase its coalition? Because I was actually listening to a few interviews by one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion, I forgot his name, uh, but he was actually saying that what current activists should do in a way is trying to broaden the appeal of, of the movement and trying to get, in a sense, more middle class people in the stereotypical sense to support it. So I'd like to hear your opinion on, on those two issues and thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, 
Um, we do disagree, which is, which is probably good. As I said at the beginning of my talk, without contraries, there is no progress. And so we can, we can uh, present contrary positions and, and uh, uh, try and have progress. In a way, it would, it would be um, superfluous for me to offer too much of a critique of the Chenoweth and Stefan. Or I don't know if it's Maria Stefan or Stephen, the co-author. I don't know how to pronounce it. I apologize, but I'm going to say Stefan. So that the Chenoweth and Stefan argument, which I touched on briefly and which you've touched on for those in the room who aren't familiar with it, it essentially says that non-violent non uh, civil, civil movements are more effective um, at, at, in, in political struggle, um, at achieving their ends, um, in, in main part, as, you, as the questioner had noted, because they have lower barriers to entry, so more people can join them because they have lower levels of risk and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and they're not morally repugnant to some people. And so they have lower barriers to entry. They allow you a larger number. It's numbers that win in the end. Their empirical studies suggest that 3.5% of the population, more or less, is um, what's needed in, to engage, which is a huge amount, of course. People think, you know, uh, um, liberation struggles have to involve all the population or half the population. This has never been true. It, it, it takes a relatively small amount of committed people to, to, to engage in serious political struggle. So they think 3.5% is a, is, a, is, a, is a useful number for delivering changes. And they present a lot of empirical evidence of, evidence of, of this suggestion. So let me say three or 20, I'll try and keep it to three things about this. <laughs> um, um, one, as I said, it would be a bit superfluous of me to critique this because a very strong critique already exists. I mentioned the book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andreas Malm. I encourage you all to read it. It's a short book. I'll send you the PDF for free. If you uh, put your email address in the chat, you'll have to deal with my annotations on my copy, but that's fine. Um, and uh, he spends quite a, uh, quite a few pages, um, maybe 10 pages, systematically debunking the data and the framing of that argument. It's very, it's very effective, it's very persuasive, and I don't, I don't simply wish to repeat it. Um, so I wanna encourage you all to read that. I will note what I think are the most salient limits of that account, the channel with and, and Stefan account. Um, they are twofold and I'll, I'll do them in ascending order. The first systematic limit to that account is um, it's very, very, very long standing as a claim, arguably thousands of years old. Um, uh, not the claim that nonviolent resistance works, but the claim that excessive militancy is alienating and you should not fight as hard. That's the structure of the Chenoweth and Stephen argument and the Extinction Rebellion argument. Um, Extinction Rebellion is a different discussion I'd be happy to have, um, but uh, also called Sunrise Movement in some places and, and, and so on. Um, but that argument, don't fight so hard you'll turn people off, um, fight less hard and more people will join you, has been the argument of power for millennia. And it's somewhat disturbing, I would even say demoralizing and shocking to hear people who imagine themselves to be opposed to power to accept it. It's such a classic ideological formulation, fight less hard, be conventional, and you can win unconventional changes. I would say on the face of it, history tells us that that's nonsense. However, I wanna be more specific in my criticism of, of the position of Chenoweth and Stephen. If you read through the book, which our questioner, again, tell me your name. Uh, Luca. Luca, pleasure to meet you, I'm Joshua. I should have asked everyone their name. I apologize, it's early in the morning for me. Um, uh, uh, in Luca's uh, um, account of the book, um, which is, I think, an accurate, fair account, and it pretends to be very factual and empirical, and it has data and study and numbers, it looks at, and this is very relevant to the talk I gave, I was very much had it in mind, it looks at movements that have asked, for the most part, and won quite mild reformist changes. And they may be correct about that, 
if the thing you want is a limited change in a specific law, it may well be that a nonviolent form of organization is the most useful way to get it. I will accept that. However, if what you want is uh, a systematic change, not the fall of one regime to be replaced by the other, because by now we know the tragedy of the Arab Spring, right? The Arab Spring is measured as nothing but success in the Chenoweth book, like examples of movements that were successful, but they weren't successful. The people wanted the fall of the regime. They got it. They got a different regime that was the same, slightly better, slightly worse, much worse. If what you want is that kind of change that's not much of a change, that is not a systematic change, they may be correct. Their data does not show that nonviolent movements can deliver systematic change, change in the mode of production, change like... And, and I, I challenge you all to show me the historical moment in which there were systematic changes in, in the mode, not the, not the name of the king, but the mode of governance in the mode of production. I challenge you to show me the nonviolent movements that delivered those. Um, I just don't think they can speak to the crisis at hand. They can speak to how to win limited policy reforms to get back to my, to, to my, to, to my talk. Um, in ways that are maybe persuasive, although Mom is somewhat skeptical of that as well. Uh, so I don't find them very useful for thinking about the current crisis because they cannot at all encompass, gather in, register the stakes of the current situation. They think that um, there's a way forward via policy change. There isn't. So they simply aren't relevant speakers to the current situation. I hope that answers your question. But again, it's okay if we disagree. Um, but what I what I would hope, right, is that it doesn't is that all this supposed data isn't just a a, a veil for moral preferences about violence, uh, um, which it often. I'm not I'm not accusing Chenoweth and Stefan of that. Often, for many of us, we offer sort of supposedly practical claims that are a veil for a moral skepticism about violence. And I hope that we can separate those two things. What, what, what might practically get it done? Because that's the only question. The question is not, um, how do you get more people on your side? The question is how to achieve the thing we need to achieve. Um, and uh, um, I just hope we can hold that question in mind. Sorry for such a long answer. I feel strong about this topic. No, thank you. I, I really appreciated it. I've also sent my email address from uh, in the chat. I'm copying. I'm copying it right now. About the book, and what I wanted to say is, I'll definitely have a look at the data and in terms of how they define the scope to look at the movements. And yeah, I, I suppose my my viewpoint is that to achieve this change, they need as many people as possible looking either through the means or through the people behind them. Thank you very much for the informative answer. Thank you for the thoughtful question. I appreciate it. Uh, by the way, everyone, if you can still hear me, I'm putting my email address in the chat, not the same one I've been using with Zach, but my, my non-professional email address. Uh, everyone who's here should feel welcome to email me if you have questions or thoughts, I'll try and answer. I'm happy to send you PDFs uh, if I have them and make available whatever resources uh, I can be helpful with. So I wanted to, to make sure that was available. I don't know how we transfer it from chat to the people sitting there in the room, but feel feel free just to write it on the board or tell people or whatever. All right. Are there uh, any more final questions? It's just about time. Um, technically, it's five minutes left. But if there's any questions in the Zoom um, or if there's any left um, in person? If not, then then just a big thanks uh, to Joshua for 
uh, the brilliant talk and for answering all of the questions so thoroughly. Um, uh, so yes, I don't see any more questions. So yeah, uh, thank you so much. And I'm sure uh, we'll be in contact as well as probably some of uh, the other students here. Yeah, everyone feel welcome to contact me. Thanks again, everyone, and, and Zach and Katerina, especially. I really, I really appreciate the invitation. It was great to spend some time with you. Have a good dinner. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good breakfast. I'm going to go swimming. Yeah. Uh, I'll see you later. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.